The following program is made possible with support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley. And I'm Heather Berlin. We're going to be reviewing current movies, TV shows, and sometimes checking out a blast from the past, but from a scientific point of view. Today, we're going to talk about fear, not fun, scary movie fear, real human fear, and what it does to us, how it affects our decisions and our perception. The first film we're going to look at is Force Majeure a fascinating foreign film from Swedish director Ruben Ostlund. Force Majeure is a story about a family on a ski holiday, and they're watching a controlled avalanche on their lunch break when suddenly it appears that they're about to be overcome by a real avalanche. The mother grabs her two children to protect them, and the father grabs his cell phone and flees. I don't the experience that we were with. Privacy. What do you want? Come se ut av vinden så att du kunde komma tillbaka och grabba dem upp. Fear is universal, fear is visceral, and in this film, it's very funny in a Swedish sort of way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would maybe I would say less funny, more painful, or painfully funny. Um, but I, I mean, before we start talking about the science, I just was curious what you thought about the story, like as a mother and as a wife. Yeah, you can see the wife and mother lunge for her children to protect them. And you can make out this man with the, with the frame of mind to, to grab his phone, his smartphone, and run, and run from his family. And I thought that can't be happening. And yet that's, that's what the whole movie is really, a, it's a fallout from, from that one scene. And I just, you know, you can tell me when we start talking about the science of this and what happens in our brains when we're afraid, but I just thought rather smugly and, and fiercely, I, I would never run from my family or my children. I mean, once you become a parent, you triage your children above all else. How, yeah. how did you feel? Yeah, I mean, I felt the same way. I, I, well, first, I remember I told my husband about the film, and then he said, no, that can't be. No man would ever run from his kids. And I'm like, no, I swear, really, it happened in, in the movie. So, so he wa I made him watch it with me. And, and he kind of couldn't believe it either. And he said, well, uh, you know, if I did that, you, you, you'd forgive me, right? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I'd be out the door. No. But I think there's a difference between, like, the, a, a female's reaction as well, like, to your children. And, and, and also, like, evolutionarily speaking, like, we women invest even more in their children because you can only have so many of them, right? right. Men, if they lose their children, they can maybe still go out and have a couple more. So, you know, from that perspective, he was maybe more interested in saving his own life and not as invested in the children as the mother was, who wouldn't dream of leaving her children. So there's these two instincts at play that are competing. And in the, in the moment of fear, when there's a threatening situation, you know, no one can really predict how they're going to act. But there's definitely a social fallout if you don't behave in the moral way. So people should be thinking about their social reputation, which is just as important as, you know, protecting your own body and, and well-being. But I guess that's what it comes down to is how much, in, in a moment of intense fear, how much do we think? You know what I mean? There's not, I, I, I highly doubt, you can tell me, mm -hmm. if there's a thought process where, where we think this through. How, will I be ostracized by my community? Will my wife hate me? You know, are my children safe? I mean, Tomas, this father, just takes off. Yeah. So there's there's these in the in the immediate moment there's two processes that happen. So basically there's a threatening situation and there's immediate signal that's sent to your brain to the amygdala to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases uh, certain neurochemicals, they release cortisol and adrenaline and they prepare your body for either getting ready to fight this threat or to flee. 
right? So you get, you know, increased blood flow to the muscles, increased heart rate, decreased digestion, ready to fight. And but now in terms of the emotion of the fear, there's two networks. You have what we call a fast network that it goes straight to the thalamus and then to the amygdala, which is kind of a fear center in the brain and then to be directly to behavior. So you're not thinking about it. It's just this automatic kind of fear feeling reaction. Then there's a slower pathway where it goes from the thalamus to the cortex where you're having more conscious thought about the stimuli that's threatening and then it goes to the amygdala and then there's behavior. This happens simultaneously. Yeah, but one is faster and the other is a bit slower. So the first thing you get is the fearful feeling. Like it's almost like when you're in your car and you're driving and something, you know, goes in front of you and you immediately get that rush of adrenaline and slam on the brake before you have time to think of anything, right? And then Afterwards, you have a few moments to think, okay, is this still- Think of names to call the person right. <laughs> who hit you. Is this still a threatening situation? How should I respond? So we have what's called a cognitive appraisal of the emotion. But his instinct was to either, he, his body, you know, the avalanche is coming, he got this rush of cortisol, his body was ready to either fight or flight, and his immediate reaction was to flee. Now the cognition sort of comes after where you sort of evaluate the situation and say, wait, my kids are here, my wife is here, maybe I shouldn't go with that immediate reaction and maybe I should stay. And he had enough time to have that thought process because he had enough time to pick up his phone. Exactly. And that's the key. If he was cognizant enough to think about, oh, I better not leave my phone here, that means he had enough time to think about the actual consequences of his actions and he still chose to leave. Well, then that sort of answers a question I had, which was in the movie, he says to his wife that he was so afraid that he wasn't in control of his actions. And, and you're telling me, I think, that that is neurologically sound for some people, but in Thomas's case, it seems, since he had the presence of mind to pick up his phone, he was in control of his actions? Yeah, I mean, it's a hard thing. When, you know, we talk about neurologically sound, I think saying something is neurologically sound doesn't necessarily justify the behavior, right? So it just means it could happen. It right? could happen. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 we are our brain and the way we behave is based on what's happening in our brains. And so everything is basically neurologically sound. So is murder and rape and all these other things that we find, you know, horrible and amoral, but we also, it's neurologically sound. These people's brains are working that way, but he, you know, didn't take responsibility. He just said, oh, it's, you know, my instincts. I couldn't help myself. Is that true, though? So it depends. In the case of Tomas, he obviously had full control of his faculties, right? He's a person who has a family, has a job, has a life. He's not someone, let's say, there are certain people who have brain damage in their prefrontal cortex or certain levels of, of mental disorder where they can't control their impulses. Like, there's just physically, it's not possible for them, but he obviously has the capacity to have self-control. And in that case, as evidence, you're basing this on the evidence that he grabbed his smartphone? Is well, no, on mean? the evidence in general that in his everyday life, he has self-control, right? He's not a person who doesn't have the capacity to have self-control. Maybe. Right. Actually, later in the film, he has this confession of deficit of character that I think muddies his whole excuse. Oh, I was so afraid I wasn't in control. Later on in the film, he confesses to his wife, I've done this, this, and that, I've cheated on you. And, and so it, it complicates this idea that fear can, can rob us of our self-control. Well, I think there's two arguments there. One is I'm just acting on instinct and I have no control. The other is, wait, I'm actually not a good person. I'm making these decisions that are not moral and I'm aware of that. And that's different than a person who, you know, there are certain people who have brain damage or a neurochemical imbalance where they get an urge to do something and they just cannot stop themselves no matter what. But he has the capacity to stop himself, but yet he chooses not to because of selfish reasons. I mean, I think the real thing is he's a selfish person. And even in the end of the film, you could see you know, at the end of the film, he, he picks up a cigarette and starts smoking in front of his kid, which is a very like hedonistic you know, thing to do. It's not really thinking about the others. It's just about his own personal pleasure and desire at the expense of whoever else. And that's just a character flaw. So yeah. So scientifically speaking, Dr. Heather Berlin, yeah. is Tomas a jerk? <laughs> you know, I would say, He's not so much a jerk as he is a coward. Um, and I think that he let, he, his fear response is so strong that he just can't seem to override it at some level. 
and he's really about self-protection. You know, because in other aspects of his life, he seemed like he was a pretty nice guy. You know, he had his family, and he seemed like, all up until the point when the avalanche came, he seemed like he was pretty, you know, okay. Yeah, that's like I mean, three minutes into the I know, movie. it's true. <laughs> and, and he was hot, so that was a little distracting. Yeah. But I think he's pathetic more than a jerk. You know, I kind of felt bad for him and thought, because there's this thing in, in, in evolutionary psychology, they did, they did studies cross-culturally to look at what people value in terms of being a man, manliness. Mm -hmm. And they call it, they found across all cultures, there's the three Ps, which is the men are valued for their ability to provide, to protect, and to procreate. I thought there was another P coming. <laughs> okay. I can only imagine. But so, if they feel like they don't have the capacity to do one of those things, it actually they feel less value yeah. as a man in general. I mean, not for everybody. And so he was able to procreate. Obviously, he had kids and to provide for his family. But his ability to protect, you know, his whole sort of essence of who he is as a man is destroyed, and how his wife views him as well. And so that I think is a major, you know, that was the thing that I was thinking about a lot in this movie. And, and when my husband said, "Oh, you'd forgive me, right?" And I said, "No. Like the yeah. ability for you to protect it's so your fundamental. family. It's so fundamental. It's like game over. I'm yeah. not attracted to you anymore, and I can't trust you." Exactly. Yeah. Heather, you talk about things from a sort of evolutionary point of view, and and what females have looked for in males forever. You know, th these P's: protect, provide, and procreate. So when Ebba, the mother and wife in this movie, finds out that her husband does not, in fact, protect, she works really hard to still keep the family together because she lives in this modern world where he doesn't have to fend off lions. So would you say that in, in a modern world that these three Ps apply less? Well, I mean, I think in a practical sense, yes. You know, now that women can work and also be providers, um, we maybe are having the view of what we value in men is changing. And we're like, for example, we're expecting men to be more involved in childcare and, you know, housework and that kind of thing. And so maybe she values that from him and isn't looking at him so much as being a protector, but more of a part of this family unit, which you can understand. But I also think that after many, 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 many years of evolution, I mean, this modern time that we're in right now is so short that, you know, we're kind of these like, stone age brains right in a modern kind of world or in a modern skull and so all of those deep sort of desires to have this protector aren't going to go away so mm. fast and so you can tell even though she might have made a conscious decision to stay with him that her the way she looks at him as a man and values him is probably certainly diminished our next film looks at the political implications of fear Rosewater is the directorial debut of The Daily Show's Jon Stewart, based on the life of Iranian-Canadian journalist Maziar Bahari. Bahari is detained by Iranian forces who brutally interrogate him under suspicion that he is a spy. You must take his hope. Your wife will never see you again. Your child, your child will never know you. Fight, Ozzy. Use your freedom. Use their weakness. <laughs> what are you doing? They locked you up, but you're still free. In their hearts, they know they cannot win. We're delighted to be joined today by journalist Ira Flato, host of PRI's Science Friday. So Ira, what did you think of Rosewater, the film? I, I liked it. I liked it on a lot of different levels. Uh, one of the levels I liked it about it is that it showed us uh, that the Iranian culture is not monolithic. You know, we always think that we, first of all, we make the Middle East one place and we describe everybody in the Middle East as being alike. And I like the little nuances in there that showed us that there are different levels of society in, in Iranian culture. His captors, um, they don't want to beat him much, right? Because they want him to look good for the cameras. So they use psychological torture. And my question is, does the brain manifest psychological torture differently than it would physical torture? Yeah, I, it's interesting. You know, Psychological pain, I mean, people often call that psychological pain, is very similar to physical pain in terms of the circuits that are activated in the brain. 
So when we're feeling an emotional pain, it's a similar pain circuit as when you're feeling a physical pain. So it's just as bad, if not worse, because with the psychological you know, trauma or torture, it's lingering and it lasts and it can continue to eat away at you. You know, if you get punched in the face, it hurts for a minute, you know, you can heal. Not that it's a good thing, but the psychological, and that's why in the film they said something like, you know, we don't want to make him bleed, but we want to make him lose hope. And that was how they were going to really get to him because that, over time, our mind is who we are. And if you kind of plant these sort of negative seeds in someone's mind, it could cause a lot more damage than a punch in the face. What certainly turned him around at the end was what they, they got to his family, right? Yeah. And he was fearful that they would do something to his wife and his unborn child. And his mother. And his mother, yeah. yeah. Which was interesting because, you know, as opposed to the, the previous film that we talked about, you know, he was a coward because he didn't protect his family. And in this film, in a way, he sort of, it was a coward in the sense that he gave up, you know, he said, okay, I'll go on TV and I'll say whatever you want me to say. I'll sign whatever you want me to sign. You know, where his father figure in the film was saying, no, be yeah. strong, you know, and in a sense, in his father's eyes, he was being a coward, but he was doing that to protect his family and his mother. So again, you know, it's a, a different dynamics happening. And in one case, he's pr not protecting the family, he's a coward. In this case, he is, and in some ways, he's being a coward. So you show, in both films, are seeing two different tests of the personality of the, of the, of the man in the, in the film, right? In the first test. In the first measure film. of a man under fear. Yes, under fear, under pressure, how will he react? And I, you know, I was listening to your conversation before, and um, we all have been a part of fear. And I think we really never know, and you, uh, you made this point, we really will never know how we're going to react to fear until it happens to us, mm -hmm. you know, and, or people being afraid. If you talk to... Medal of Honor winners, you, they, they've done some heroic things, and you say, why did you do that? And they say, I don't even remember. I have no reason why. Were you afraid? I don't know. You know, it, a different it, kind of fear, it manifests itself. Because fear, fear is a universal emotion that we, we all have as human beings. But I think it makes sense that people have different reactions to the fear, because if everybody responded as being the hero, that also would not be adaptive for the group. There needs to be a couple of people within a population that are the risk takers, that are the ones that are fearless, that are going to, you know, take a chance and maybe they'll die and maybe they won't. But if everybody was like that, that also would be maladaptive. Is resiliency and, and the willingness to, to stand up to fear, um, is that kind of a... a a heritable trait or is there a gene for resiliency? Yeah, this is actually a really a new field um, now in psychiatry where people really are investigating resiliency. They're looking at Holocaust survivors. They're looking at people who go to war and either, you know, they all experience the same traumatic events and some develop PTSD and others seem to be more immune to that. And why is that? And there, there does seem to be a genetic component to it. Um, and so like in this film, you know, both his father and his sister sort of survived and were strong in the face of, you know, torture and imprisonment and so you know you would think that he might also inherit this trait now it seems that he might have inherited the trait for kind of rebelliousness but I still saw him as being you know he caves you know he didn't stay strong in the face of fear and maybe it was because of his family and his children and maybe that's why and if he didn't have the wife or you know and the newborn baby coming uh, that maybe he would have acted differently but he stays plenty strong right he stays strong enough to make a conscious decision to get himself out of this very dangerous situation, right? With his, I mean, you, you could argue that, with his family in mind. Um, in this film, I, I, uh, humor bumps up against fear really beautifully, I think. And there's this, I mean, there are several great scenes, but one in, in which his, his torturer is asking him, you know, who is this Anton Chekhov? that you like because he has a Facebook <laughs> like, right? Yeah. And then there's, we, we all know John Stewart is from New Jersey and there's just sort of this great running gag about New Jersey, right? And, and, um, and Bahari, as, as a character, sort of latches onto this and says to his torturer, you know what happens in New Jersey as if it's completely debauched. Um, does our ability to find things funny uh, because Bahari finds it funny, like this is sort of, it, it kind of buoys him, right? Mm -hmm. Does our ability to find things funny kind of insulate us from the worst effects of fear? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two really strong, and you can really see the, set, the, the influence of Jon Stewart, I think, in this with the satire and the humor. I mean, 
first of all, humor is disarming. And, and in a way, he gains a bit of control in that scene over his torture. By using this humor, he had a leg up. And we all saw that, right? And we all kind of looked at the torturer now as being kind of an <laughs> idiot. Yeah. And so that's why I think a lot of these regimes, and, and, and you know, and we've seen it with the Charlie Hebo, is that satire is so threatening because it disarms the people in power. And another aspect of humor is it's also a defense mechanism. So, you know, when something really traumatic is happening, or you're having traumatic emotions, you can, we call it, it's called sublimation. It's one of the defense mechanisms, but you can, you know, put that fear into something humorous and it can kind of resolve it in a more, um, it kind of softens the, it softens the fear, so to speak. So he got have been using humor to help and also it was disarming his um, torturer. But, but also John Stewart and the writers are using humor to give you a chance to breathe a little bit. Because mm -hmm. the drama gets, you know, Shakespeare did this in his plays, because the drama gets so heavy and mm -hmm. you get so fearful, just throw a little bit of humor in there and we can sit back and, you know, and, and go on with the rest of the scene. And also it's just showing, you know, I think it was important to show the ridiculousness of, you know, the whole, the insulation, first of all, of knowledge of not understanding what's happening in the outside world and kind of how, how ridiculous that all is. And, and yeah. But that's, again, where humor and fear can bump up so closely. It's, it was terrifying when you realize in the film, oh my gosh, they really don't understand what something like The Daily Show is and that he is not a spy and, and it was completely a joke. That, when, when you realize that there is, there's no way to reason with your captors because they don't understand humor, that was, that was truly terrifying. That's when I thought, uh-oh, he may not get out of there. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they couldn't understand the satire and they were you know, saying, oh, you're a spy, you're a spy because of this interview he did on the Jon Stewart show, you know, meant that there was this huge gap in their, uh, like being able to comprehend, that there's such a big divide in the ways of thinking, you know. And that's, one, and that's one way to instill fear in the audience, too, is because it's so obvious to you that this is, you know, a, a comedy bit that, that, that they, what Daily Show went over there, but it's not obvious to them. And you think, well, if it's something this simple is not obvious to them, we are right. so far apart on a lot of things, and that's a very fearful kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so we've, we've discussed fear and we've discussed ignorance. But what happens if we apply those ideas to the general population? So, I mean, you you work in the public uh, with the public all the time, and what are we seeing and learning out there? It's it's a it's a really good topic because what I've learned in my years as a, as a journalist and as, as a science journalist, uh, and this is a very fearful thing for, to me as a journalist, is that um, if you really can't change people's minds, I mean. If you present them with all kinds of evidence, whether it's about vaccination and autism, or it's about global warming and the melting of the glaciers, if they, for whatever reasons, political, religious, or whatever, don't want to believe in this, they're going to find something in the data that you present them to take out that strengthens their opinion, no matter how overwhelming the data is. It's, it's scary. It's true. It's so it's actually that's why it's very hard to change people's fears like who have phobias because you can give them all the information about let's say the statistics of plane crashes but they'll find the one incident you know like but what about that crash and so it's very hard to change people's belief system their core beliefs or their schemas we would call it um, and 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 it, they have to be willing to change because if you're not willing to change no matter how much evidence in the world it's true they'll still find that one thing that's going to support the way they think. You have to have really overwhelming evidence, what we would call a paradigm shift. Something has to, and I would think that is something like that is the melting of the glaciers or, you know, the North Pole now free of ice in the summertime. It's something that confronts your vision. You know, we said your eyes are the most important things. You see this and you now have a clash going on about your logical side and your emotional side. But how can, I, I can't really deny this. And, and if you it show it often enough, people will, will, will get the, the image. Is it a different kind of brain that is willing to change its mind? Well, there are some studies which look at like the conservative brain and the liberal brain, and there are there are some differences. Um, and you know, people who are more liberal and they tend to be more open-minded. They tend to have you know personalities that are more novelty-seeking. And and people who are conservative are more you know don't like change. They like so so there are different personality types which are related to different um, having more or less of certain neurotransmitters as well. Uh, and so those people who are conservative are more likely to want to stick with what they know and not change. But, in, you know, as a scientist, you have to be willing 
to change your point of view given the evidence. I think that's what makes a really good scientist where you say, you know, I saw something and then, you know, I saw that I was wrong and therefore I had to change my idea. And, and in order to do that, it does take a certain type of personality to be able to do that. Ira, who gains and who loses in a society kept in fear? Who gains and who, who loses in a good question. Um, I think, I think it, it evolves. You know, it starts out in one direction, and, and then if it goes on long enough, um, the society catches up. I mean, a, a society that's enveloped in fear, either whether it was World War II or the Nazis or these, the countries that were behind the Iron Curtain, eventually the people won out, right? Eventually, it may take, I'm a great believer that change takes generations. You know, I, and we're talking about global warming. I don't think there's a kid alive today who's five or ten years old who's not going to believe in global warming or climate change. But that may take that whole generation to change. And we're, I think that we see that a lot in science, uh, how long it takes things to change. Well, Ira, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for coming by. You're welcome. Next time on Science Goes to the Movies, we're going to take a look at post-traumatic stress disorder as seen through the lens of two Clint Eastwood films, American Sniper and Gran Torino. Don't forget to check us out on the web at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab where you'll find past shows, additional content, and a link to our app.